kind of jump in and uh, go talk to some people. So we looking good on your side, Vlad? We are. Awesome. So, uh, so everyone, uh, welcome to Manufacturing Hub. As per normal, if you're if you're new here, uh, welcome. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Um, as per the usual, we're gonna have some uh, some community comments. We should probably do a shout out to the CSIA Executive Conference. I believe those guys are out in Denver. Uh, Arlen, every year CSI or just about every year CSI has had an event. I'm like, I'd really love to go, and I am just committed somewhere else. So told Lisa Richter that we're going to try really hard uh, next year to uh, to attempt to uh, to be there in person. And hopefully I won't commit myself to uh, to a client on site months before. Well, that maybe you can stream live from CSIA. I, I would love to stream live from CSIA. <laughs> if I wasn't actively streaming live from a client site, I would probably be in Denver, Colorado right now. So uh, so, so hopefully next year, Vlad and I can, uh, can make it to CSIA. Um, and there are a bunch of other, like uh, it has been amazing seeing the groundswell of people showing up and showing back up to, uh, to conferences. It is, it is certainly one of those, man, there are probably like 40 people I'd really like to see for the first time in about three years at, uh, at a handful of these conferences. And, uh, and yet I have not been able to make it there, but, uh, but uh, congratulations to everyone who's there. Uh, Vlad certainly has uh, FOMO from all of the amazing pictures that, uh, that you guys are are posting. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to continue with our, well, I guess we're actually going to finish our IIoT theme. And as we were talking about IIoT, there are very few people that I felt like we had to get. And Arlen, as you guys will soon see, it, is is one of those people, uh, potentially one of the, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, I guess, I guess, yeah, um, kind of the, the other major thing that we do is we, we embarrass Vlad slightly. So Arlen, uh, you may or may not know, Vlad runs a, a YouTube channel called Solus PLC. We'll wave hi to uh, the few dozen or so people who are currently watching us live. They've they've recently crested 31,000 subscribers and Vlad doesn't like it to ask people to subscribe to any of his stuff. And so I'm the guy that gets to ask everyone to, uh, to go ahead and subscribe. So I have, I have also learned, Arlen, that when I ask people to like subscribe and download the podcast, people do it more. And that significantly helps the numbers of like people who watch. So uh, for the first time this episode, uh, guys, please hit the subscribe button for Solus PLC. Uh, please follow Vlad, myself, follow Arlen, follow Cirrus Link, and the Manufacturing Hub Network on LinkedIn. If you want to make sure that you stay up to date on all of everything Vlad and I are doing with the show for Arlen, this theme, and beyond, uh, please check us out at manufacturinghub.live, where you can sign up for a once-weekly newsletter that gives you somewhere between about 30 and 65 minutes notice as a reminder that we are going live on uh, on Wednesday afternoons. Um, and, and again, a big thank you to Phoenix Contact uh, for sponsoring this theme and their, their continued support. Uh, Vlad and I have had a ton of fun uh, working, talking all about IIoT and uh, and I hope that we've answered a bunch of questions, and I'm sure we've ruffled a ruffled a few feathers. Uh, but no, Vlad. Before we jump in, uh, any uh, excuse me, any comments, any thoughts? No, thank you, Dave. Uh, I want to say that you're committing us to many conferences next year. You know, so I'm just cautioning. Maybe we'll we'll spend the whole year on the on the road. But uh... I'm not sure I'm committing us to anything, Vlad. I'm pretty sure I'm saying I hope to attend. Um, uh, yes, I'm pretty sure I'm saying I, I hope to attend. I am generally very good at not committing to uh, to, to committing to very little. Uh, but no, I, I hope we can absolutely make it to at least one or two conferences uh, towards the end of this year and a couple of the big ones uh, next year. But no, with that, uh, everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub. I'm Dave. This guy up here is Vlad. We are talking all about IoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. And with that, we want to welcome our very special guest this week, Arlen Nipper, President and CTO of SiriusLink. Ar Arlen, thank you for being here. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. I follow your show. I've seen a lot of the episodes. It's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us, Arlen. Before we dive into the technical <laughs> aspects of IoT, could you give us a background? How did you get started in manufacturing, automation, internet, industrial internet of things? And ultimately, how did you end up at Cirrus Link? Okay. Well, uh, as a, I grew up on a farm in northern Oklahoma, but my dad had been an engineer for NASA. He worked on the lunar excursion module that landed on the moon. 
So as was expected, I went to Oklahoma State in electrical engineering. And I don't know, maybe two or three years into that, I'm going, this is boring. I, I got to get out of here. And, you know, as I'm walking to my advisor's office to say I'm going to quit, I saw a job posting and it said summer intern at Amico Oil Company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I thought, OK, well, I'll we'll see what that's like. So I get to Tulsa, and this is 1978, 1979 ish. And they said, hey, we've just started this new, it's called the microprocessor RD lab. So that summer, as a project, I got to wire wrap an RCA 1802. And if you guys Google it, you'll see that RCA came out with the first ever CMOS microprocessor. It ran at 500 kilohertz and it had 128 bytes of RAM. And that summer, I got to write machine language programming for a downhole gauging project. And I came out of there going, this is cool stuff. So I went back, I dropped as many uh, analog courses as I could. I got a minor in computer science. And uh, when I graduated, I went to work for Coke Oil. And they had just started a refinery in Medford, Oklahoma, and they were building pipelines from Medford, Oklahoma to Mont Bellevue, Texas, where the plastic uh, manufacturing is. So for the three years, I got to do everything from uh, run a ditch witch to put in, you know, 3,000 horse Westinghouse motors, put in centrifugal pumps, wire those up to vacuum tube starters. And then there was this new thing came out in 1980. It was called a Modicon 484 PLC. So we got the right uh, ladder logic for a Modicon PLC. Um, Modbus came out in 1978. So it had already been around for like a year. So <clears throat> we hooked up the PLC to a 300 baud modem on a multi-drop phone line. AT&T would run multi-drop lines wherever you needed them. And that all went back to a, our, our control computer was uh, running on a PDP 1144. So that was my exposure in getting started with everything from automation to communication protocols. I can't say we had networks yet. We had modems, if you, if you can imagine. So that kind of got me started on, on this career path. And then about eight years after Coke, I was one, uh, one of the founders of a company called Arcom Control Systems, and we started making protocol converters. So all of these crazy protocols that were invented in the 1970s, remember, we were doing telemetry in the 70s and on into the 80s, we would make little protocol converters to convert, you know, A to B and B to C and C to D and actually did quite well in that market. Then in the Mid-1990s, a very disruptive thing happened to the whole industry, and probably people don't rec realize that AT&T got deregulated. And when AT&T got deregulated, they, they were controlling most of the telemetry and factory and all these networks over their multi-drop phone line systems. Well, when they got split up, all of that started, all the quality went away, the price went up. And what happened is all the VSAT vendors jumped in. So you had Galat, GE, SpaceNet, Scientific Atlanta, AT&T, Tritum. We're all putting out these VSAT systems so that we could get that data back into a central computer location. Arlen, just to clarify, sorry to interrupt. When you say deregulated, uh -huh. you mean that AT&T networks were allowed to be accessed by other vendors. Is that, is that correct? No, they were broken up into private companies. So, okay. for instance, we had a booster station in Conroe, Texas, and that was managed. All the communications were managed by AT&T. After the breakup, that was now Conroe Telephone Company, run by the local communications. They didn't even know what a Bell 202 modem was, let alone how you would get data in and out of it. So the, the, the VSAT vendors, although it was very good, it was a double whammy because guess what? They all invented their own transport protocols to get the data over their VSAT network back into a central location. 
So you have these proprietary protocols going over proprietary transports. So finally, in 1998, uh, we were working on a project for Philips 66, and they got their first AT&T VSAT system that was using TCP IP as the transport. Now, every, all, most of the audience here is going to go, yeah, you know, TCP IP, that's what everybody uses. But remember, in the late 90s, DECnet was the was the the most used networking out there. And then there was IBM and there was Novell. There were all these other proprietary networking protocols in addition to TCP IP. So when AT&T did that, we found out that it was very slow to pull over a VSAT system, get your data back. But then one of the managers at Philips 66 goes, hey, we're talking, my good friend runs the IT department at Philips 66, and they're using this new technology called service-oriented architecture. And instead of writing applications that are tightly coupled to other applications, they would write applications that publish information to a broker. And then other applications could subscribe to that. And all of a sudden, you decoupled your applications from each other so that if Vlad made a change to one program, that didn't affect all of the other consumers of that data. And so we, we thought about this and say, what if we were to run an industrial network, a SCADA, a, a mission critical real-time pipeline control system using publish and subscribe instead of pull response. So um, uh, my partner in crime, if you will, Andy Stanford Clark was a fellow at IBM and he knew all about how IBM message oriented middleware work. And I had at this point, what, 25 years of industrial protocols and how our SCADA systems and our DCS systems work. So late 1998, early 1999, Andy and I sat down and we took what was then big IBM MQ and we smashed it down and we smashed it down and we smashed it down. And the result of that was the MQTT protocol. So that literally, Andy and I invented MQTT on a project for a customer. Remember, we had no idea about the internet of things. There was no such thing as cloud computing. Security was security by obscurity, right? We didn't, nobody worried about that. Um, it, it, just, it just happened. But, you know, the biggest thing, challenge I will say is that Andy and I did the first uh, MQTT spec. It took us about six, seven months. It took us 18 months to work through the IBM lawyers to make sure that MQTT remained an open standard. And I don't, I think had we not done that, we wouldn't be on this call. Nobody would have heard of MQTT because it would have been another proprietary thing that just went away. So I think that was kind of the genesis of getting MQTT out there and then get, getting the standard ratified by the OASIS standards body for international standards, and then ultimately getting the PAHO project started in the Eclipse Software Foundation, where probably 80, 90% of everybody that's doing MQTT probably started with some of the information and the reference implementation code that you can get from the Eclipse Foundation. So with that, you know, things went along. Uh, again, if you want, you know, I'm the poster child for how not to sell MQTT solutions because for a dozen years, I flew all around the world. You know, Dave and I were just talking about how many millions of miles I have on American Airlines trying to sell IT down to OT. And the, the epiphany that I've had over the, well, since we started CirrusLink is that one of the reasons we started CirrusLink is that we wanted to focus on OT-centric MQTT solutions. So what we want to do is give the engineers, give the technicians, this is an, if we look at the industrial internet of things, it's not IT down to OT. It's enabling OT with the tools and technologies to get an infrastructure that's cloud ready. So it's OT to IT, not IT down to OT. I like that 
approach, but you know, I guess like the the curious thought, Arlen, is talking to people who are using MQTT. There's a lot of use cases outside of industrial, right? So I'm I'm wondering why necessarily the focus on industrial when there's a lot of applications. I think also in in the automotive space, from what I understand, are very I say I would say like benefiting from MQTT. And I guess like your thoughts in general, maybe on the other spaces and examples, because I'm sure you have plenty uh, before we dive into the industrial space. Well, again, that's the, that, that's the thing. That's the exciting thing to me. I mean, uh, if I think back, people ask me, you know, where, where was the tipping point with MQTT? Because it had been around for probably 12, 13, 14 years before it, it started this, this adoption curve that just went exponential almost. And it was one of those things. And one of the first things that kicked it off, there was a blog from Facebook Messenger team. Yep. And the Facebook Messenger team had done the first version of Facebook Messenger. And it, it ate the battery out of your cell phone. It was slow. It was unreliable. And they were basically given an edict that, hey, you guys got to fix this. And so in this blog post, they said, oh, we found this thing called MQTT. We started using it. And you know what? It was great. It was fast. It was simple. Uh, you know, the, the thing I say about MQTT is this, keep it simple, stupid. That, that's the beauty of MQTT. And in this blog, for all of the reasons that we did MQTT for industrial, all of these other sectors picked it up too. So you, you can use it, like you said, in telemetry from cars, from Facebook Messenger, ATM machines use it. I've heard that Rumba vacuum sweepers, uh, garage door openers, um, you know, all of these. So what's interesting to me is that Andy and I did not dictate a message. We didn't dictate a, a topic namespace and we didn't dictate a payload. We just said, okay, here's a real simple messaging thing and you can publish anything you want on any topic. And what happened is the world did. And so MQTT is proliferating and every day I get an email or I get a LinkedIn message or I get, you know, notification. Oh, we're using MQTT here. We're using it there. We're using it over here. So I think that's the beautiful thing of MQTT is it just gives you that reliable messaging capability and then you can go off and do with it what you want. Now, what we're going to talk about in the industrial space is we'll go back to it. The beautiful thing about MQTT is you can publish anything you want on any topic. The problem with MQTT is you can publish anything you want on any topic. And there, Vlad, is where we ran into that interoperability. How do you keep it open and, and keep everybody working, but yet at least start putting together some uh, semantics and some guidance on if we want to do this in the industrial space, what's the best way to do it going forward? Yeah, and I would say there's a lot of, again, uh, in terms of applications, I think sending data is maybe the <clears throat> most basic use case that you can find in the industrial space, but you can send images, you can send files, you can send all kinds of like different analog even values. There's a lot of, I would say maybe less, um, how to say like less obvious applications that MQTT can be used for. And I think, as you've said, people have found interesting applications. And again, I would love to discuss that as well, but I think it's <laughs> it, it's just interesting to see how the, I would say the software slash like engineering community picks up a protocol and is able to almost mold it for the specific application. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I think the first round, and, and so what I saw, again, it kind of, if we look at this from a timeline standpoint, there was that, that initial blog that came out from Facebook. There was the fact that, you know, Andy and I about that same time got the PAHO working group started in the Eclipse Foundation. About the same time, uh, the Oasis standards body said, hey, this is MQTT. When Andy and I did the first spec, it was 3.1.0. It went through the OASIS standards body. It came out as 3.1.1, which was incredible. So in other words, the standard body didn't destroy it um, going through. So I think that was kind of the start of the proliferation. And people said, well, this, this might be a good, 
and let's not get Internet of Things confused with the industrial Internet of Things. But all of a sudden, if you look at if you looked out there, you had Azure, you had IB, you had AWS, you had Google Cloud Platform, you had IBM Watson, you had SAP Leonardo, and guess what? They were all putting MQTT ingest capabilities in, and they did that for that reason. And the the other thing we can't forget as we're talking about this discussion is that Andy and I cheated. You know, when when we start again, this is 1998, 1999. So the pressure on us was, oh, well, let's use UDP. UDP is much more efficient than TCP IP. You don't have all that overhead and you can write your own transport. And had Andy and I done that, we wouldn't be talking today either, I don't think, because what people have to realize is that number one, MQTT sets on top of TCP. So all of the goodness of TCP, the security, the fact that TLS, you know, all of that, Anything, all the new stuff that comes out, MQTT will natively be able to leverage it. That's number one. Number two is that we decided to make it to where the client was a remote originated connection into the broker. Now, let's put this in terms of industrial control system. 99% of industrial control systems today, I've got a central polling engine. You can call it whatever you want. Call it OPC UA, whatever. It's taking and it's polling Modbus or Allen Bradley or Siemens or BACnet IP or DMP 3.0. Those are, so for every device, I need to know the IP address and I need to make an outbound connection. So let's say I have 100 devices. That's 100 IP addresses I have to know about. That's 100 ports out of my factory or whatever that I've got to go out. Now, let's flip that around and say now, all of those devices implement MQTT. That connection is inbound to a single port on, a, on an MQTT broker. So all of a sudden, my cybersecurity footprint just went down by a hundredfold because I have one connection. The second thing is all those hundred ports that were open out on my devices, those don't have to be there anymore. So for using MQTT, my device doesn't have to have any ports open at all. So from a security standpoint, again, that's why the cloud providers all said, if you want to connect to your, from your factory to Azure or to AWS or to Google Cloud Platform, it's an outbound connection. There's no port open at your factory. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've seen a lot of vendors, you've mentioned a couple of them uh, on the PLC platform side are adopting MQTT. Uh, do you think that it will become the only protocol of choice, or do you think there's still space for, again, you mentioned OPC, um, there's, I guess, like a few other options, but do you think it's converging onto MQTT? Well, right now, I, again, I'd love to have the conversation, but the two major um, technology that, that I see people talking about is MQTT in, in conjunction with Sparkplug. Well, we can talk about Sparkplug here in a little bit, uh, and OPC UA. And I think those actually live together quite nicely. I mean, if you look at uh, what Link does, you know, we are a strategic partner with inductive automation. Um, and right there, inductive automation, it's cool, right? They've got uh, their Milo implementation of OPC, which is an open source uh, OPC UA client and server. They've got the MQTT modules there, and they coexist quite nicely. We go out, we use OPC UA to get the information. We get that into the internal tags, and then from there, we can start publishing out using MQTT Sparkplug. I would, I guess, like I would like to see a standardization where you know, if my pipeline from the let's say the ignition server on prem is going to send that data over MQTT to my let's say AWS or Azure cloud then it would make sense for me to also use MQTT in the field. But right now, that's not entirely possible. So, you know, you have kind of a, a mix and match of protocols. But I think it, it also, it's interesting that it still goes goes back to your first startup where you were doing a lot of these translations, which is ironically still very needed today, right? There's still this almost, uh, 
I don't want to say like a free for all of different protocols, but it, it, it's pretty much like a hodgepodge of uh, different things. But I, I guess like, do you see it being a, a single standard, or you do you still see us having this like pipeline uh, from again from the on prem, which is the best solution to M using MQTT to the cloud, and then it's still kind of in the field, mostly OPC UA at least for now, or you see these. I would say like last couple of vendors, you know, we're, we're all waiting for them. We're kind of hoping that, uh, I think Siemens has, uh, opened up an MQTT device now. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think Rockwell is still, um, I, I don't know obviously what's in development, but they have not, uh, officially, I think announced anything that supports MQTT. But and every, I don't even know if, it, go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. It, well, every month we have, we, heard, we hear about another PLC vendor, uh, OEM computer vendor, uh, that that are implementing MQTT Spark plug natively, and so I I never looked at it originally. Although the cloud is interesting to us, it's interesting the Cirrus Link, and we're doing some really cool stuff in being able to build models at the edge and publish those all the way to the cloud. We can talk about that in a bit, but I saw it as you plug in those devices behind you. You plug those into an MQTT server, and those devices tell you what you want to know. You don't have to go out and ask it what you want. It tells you, hey, I am this type of a sensor. I have these available process variables. I've got these uh, models that I'm going to publish. Uh, you can publish to this topic to change the poll rate. All of that, that, those things that we did, and we were very creative, right? We've taken Modbus that's just turned 45 years old and we've made it do things that we never imagined right we're doing floating point with two integers we're doing strings with lots of integers put together uh we're doing crazy things with modbus and we're, we're making it work right but my point is i kind of equate that modbus and mqtt are both in the keep it simple stupid category you know you can you can kind of get your head wrapped around it the spec doesn't get you know, crazy, but the bigger the spec gets, the more complex that gets, the less reliability you're going to have on implementations. And I think it's not going to be as lightweight also, right? Like the more overhead you start putting on your protocol, the more, or I guess like the, the smaller your pipeline is going to be. And I think we're also reaching those bottlenecks, right? When you have a very mm -hmm. large facility that's publishing a lot of data, well, it's becoming more and more difficult if your protocol is, again, I would say like overhead heavy versus. Well, it, and, you know, back in the day, I, you know, our aggregate baud rate when we did MQTT, mm -hmm. this is going to blow everybody away. Our aggregate baud rate over the Philips VSAT system was 300 baud. 300, not 3000, not 30,000, not 30 wow. megabit. It was 300 baud. And I've always said, I've said this for the last, you know, 25 years in our, in an industrial world, bandwidth is neither free nor is it unlimited. Mm -hmm. And to your point, whether it's a factory and they're melting down because their gigabit switches are getting slammed by pull response protocols, you know, anytime we can do really, really efficient, you know, we keep trying to keep that efficiency on, even in spark plug. Spark plug was kind of a trade off between pure binary. I can't explain it. You know, nobody could figure that out. To we started using some tools in Spark plug to be able to make it easier for people for IT, easier for people that weren't like, you know, total PLC propeller heads to be able to take these messages and do something with them. Dave, I want you to jump in the conversation as well, but I have one last question for Arlen, just to clarify. So, so I've used uh, Sparkplug for a smaller project that we did for uh, Phoenix Contact last year, but could you give us a better explanation of what Sparkplug adds to MQTT? What does it actually do, uh, maybe in, in simpler terms for me and the viewers? Okay, well, it, it actually all started at one of the Chicago automation. It was at the... Uh... I believe that one of the control engineering um, meetings, the, the one of the conferences that Dave wants to go to next year, right? And um, we had a round table and we had Travis Cox was there from inductive automation. Benson Hoogland was there from Opto 22. Um, Johnny Chen was there from OnLogic at the time. 
Um, David Lee was there from Hillshire. And in this round table, Travis mentioned, oh, we're doing MQTT now. And then Ben says, well, we're doing MQTT. And then all of a sudden, everybody agreed that, oh, we're all doing MQTT. But then as I go around to these vendors, I say, well, how do you do it? Well, we do it this way. How do you do it? We do it this way. So if we would have taken those four or five OEM devices and plugged them all into one MQTT broker, there would have been no interoperability. So what we did was that for our own sanity, Link and the, all the developers that work at Link, we've all been doing MQTT for the last 25 years. So we sat down, kind of carved out some time and said, look, let's take you know, best practices, lessons learned. How would we do this? So we came up with, with a OT-centric topic namespace. Now, number one, once you know a topic namespace, you've got plug and play because you can go out, you can do a wildcard subscription, and you can know what data is coming back. The second thing we did is we defined a template so that we could publish a model from any device into an, a system like Ignition or into you know maybe a Viva. I know is doing Sparkplug B, a Signet um, into into uh, Amazon Sitewise service. And so let's be able to define a model of a pump or a tank or a motor or whatever. And then the third thing is that what was killing us kind of in the market was that everybody that was using MQTT, kind of IT centric, they were using JSON. Mm -hmm. And I, I love JSON, I've got nothing against JSON, but let's face it, if you're on cellular or you're on VSAT, or even if you're in a factory and you've got a Modbus PLC with 10,000 tags that are all changing once a second, all of a sudden you've got huge JSON packages flying back and forth. So the middle of the road that we took is we used a technology called Google Protocol Buffers. It's well known. It's open. A ton of people use it. And Google Protocol Buffers let you buy, take basically a JSON schema that builds a binary wrapper around it, right? So now you're, you've kept that efficiency, but you've kept it easy to use. And then that, that's what flies back and forth. So spark plug defines a common namespace, a template representation. It defines a measurement, right? So instead of a register, Modbus register 40,002 and a value of 12. Okay, Vlad, what is that? Is that PSI? Is it scaled? Is it floating point? You know, there's no context. So a human, right. There's no context. So with Sparkplug, you can give it a name. You can give it engineering value, you can give it engineering high, engineering low, engineering units, you can give it, uh, tell it what the data type is, and any other metric that you want to add to contextualize that measurement. Now it's an object. Now a year from now, I go find that measurement. I know exactly where it came from. I know when it was taken. I got timestamp in milliseconds. So all of that contextual data stays with the representation. And then the last thing, the fourth thing that Sparkplug does is, it's funny, everybody reads the MQTT spec and they go, oh, we can publish this. Uh, we can subscribe to this. Let's publish and subscribe. But nobody reads the last part of the spec that says there is a death certificate built into MQTT. So one of the advantages of MQTT, since it's on TCP IP, I can publish information when it changes. So. I come up, I connect, one of those PLCs behind you says it's 100 PSI. Well, I have state, so I'm not gonna go 100 PSI, 100 PSI, 100 PSI. I'm gonna go 100 PSI, now 102 PSI. I just reduced my overall bandwidth by 80 to 95%, but I can only do that if I have state. And the state is the contract between an MQTT client and the fact that he registers a last will and testament. It says, hey, Mr. MQTT broker, if I die, here's my last will and testament. Please deliver it for me. And the way that we use that in control systems like Ignition and others is that when we get that death certificate, that means that your node fell off the network 
and we should go set all your process variables to stale. So that's how we do report by exception because we have state and we have state because we have a death certificate. And it's interesting. There's a lot, uh, you know, Arlen, there's a lot to implementing this. I think those who are listening, maybe say that it's a trivial, like maybe solution or like discussion, but there's a lot to being able to filter data the way you've described. And I, I've seen it firsthand where, again, if you're trying to hammer down a facility every like millisecond and trying to send all of that into your data lake and whichever <coughs> protocol that may be, it becomes a, a challenge really quick, right? So the ability to scale with MQTT and be able to pull by exception and when there's a change in your values, that is something that I think you have to experience to truly like understand. And kind of w once you reach that limit, you kind of know that <laughs> there is, it's very difficult to overcome. Well, but, but it is, it is, but once you get the concept, once you get the notion, if, it, you know, I love... Uh, Todd Anslinger is from Chevron and he's on the spark plug working group. And he was at the ARC conference in Orlando and he was giving his talk about, and so he, he put his dark sunglasses on and he held up his mind eraser and he clicked it in the red led flashed. And he said, forget everything you know about SCADA. Okay. Or DCS or, or PLCs. For, forget everything. Now, how would you do it today? Right. And we wouldn't be polling. We wouldn't be inventing protocols with function codes and op codes and, oh, you can only send this data type. We would yeah. go more with an, a, a, you know, in my mind, more of an enterprise service bus where my device can tell me what it's got to offer me and I don't have to go poll it all the time. I would agree. Dave, what are, what are your thoughts? So uh, I'd, I'd like to point out a couple of things. The ease in which Arlen explains this and makes it seem so easy is yeah. exact is basically the exactly the way he did it the first and second and twentieth time I heard him. And and to kind of Vlad's point, I would just like to point out that Arlen has been doing this twenty five years, right? He he is the co inventor um, and uh, kind of the, the major head of this. It is never quite as easy when you go to actually get your hands in the code and uh, and make it work as Arlen says. But uh, but but it working is an absolutely beautiful thing. Um, I will also make the comment, uh, so Arlen made a couple of comments about networking. We actually had an awesome conversation with Jaros Varghese in episode 59. Um, he talked a lot about networking and what an OT network looks like versus what an IT network looks like and many of the issues uh, that, that Arlen has kind of described. So I would suggest that you guys go back and, and take a listen if you are interested in, uh, in learning more about that. Josh is, Josh is a master of the topic and the person that I call uh, if and when we have catastrophic issues like that. So Arlen, I'd like to talk a little bit more on the industrial side, but, but first we actually had a really interesting question, right? So uh, Rick wrote in and he said, you know, he said something to the effect of, you know, uh, MQTT is coming up on 25 years old, you know, that is fairly legacy, uh, you know, age wise. Is, is MQT at some point going to be looked at in the short term as a legacy solution? Or were you guys perhaps 20 years ahead of your time and you have built a spec and a solution that the rest of the world is now ready to go ahead and leverage? <laughs> I, well, it was, a, it was fairly obscure until about mm -hmm. six or seven years ago. So yes. it kind of was, it lived, it lived at the layer of IBM you know, yeah. consulting services, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, really, I think it's the realization of what TCPI can do for it, what TCPIP does, mm -hmm. uh, what cloud computing can do, what networking mm -hmm. can do. And I think it all came together in a perfect storm of MQTT just popped up and, oh, well, geez, that's kind of simple, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it? You know, and so I think, if I put an age on it, I would say, yeah, Andy and I were ahead of our time in that, again, there was no notion of the Internet of Things. There was no notion of cloud. Uh, TCP IP was just emerging. So I think it sat there in obscurity for a very long time before something popped out. Now, you and Vlad asked me before, there's OPCUA, there's MQTT mm -hmm. and Sparkplug. I, 
I don't see anything else coming out right now. I mean, I would, I would love to, I'm a propeller head. I'd love to figure out what new things are out there. But um, right now I think there's a ton of, of really cool applications and we take, you know, like the, the PLC manufacturers, if I'm going to do a really small compact sensor, right? My overhead, if you look at the MQTT spec, the original one that Andy and I did, it was 18 pages long, mm. 18 pages. I mean, typically when I'm working with OEMs that are trying to do MQTT, they may not have all the kinks worked out, like mm. you said, Vlad, or they, but they probably can get a client up and running in a day. Mm-hmm. You know, so <laughs> which is amazing, which is uh, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, so you you personally, you guys as seriously, you guys work in kind of the Internet of Things, right? So I, I know we talked about kind of moving data up and down from the uh, to and from the cloud. I think you guys do some work uh, kind of porting into AWS and GCP and Azure and all of those things. Is there an application? that we can perhaps talk about of what you guys are helping or what you've seen clients work with in IIoT leveraging MQTT? Well, yeah. So again, since my background was oil and gas, yep. uh, I would say probably the first three or four years that we were doing projects were mm-hmm. all uh, pipeline control, all pipeline control systems. Right. Yep. But let's get outside of that and look more, look for from a, you know, a mission critical command and control more to the industrial internet of things. So we had an opportunity with the state of Indiana and the state of Indiana had all this federal funding coming in, right? So we have all this federal money. Well, do we, do we build $500 million worth of sidewalks and street lamps or do we do something for the manufacturers in the state of Indiana? Mm-hmm. So they started putting together this factory of the future and an energy insights program. And the energy insights program is targeting the, you know, 1000 of the small to medium manufacturers in the state of Indiana to at least get them started on their digital transformation journey, their, their journey into the industrial internet of things. So we started with that. And the, what, the big partner there was, was Amazon. And I think, uh, Vlad, you made a statement a while ago. Of, well, we can throw millions of measurements into a data lake and it becomes a data swamp. And because then you have to write all this code. I find it very ironic that we start with, we start with a perfectly good PLC. We define all this. Um, we start with something like Ignition or another uh, platform. And we define the UDT and we've got all of that data in there. And we've got the uh, motor operated valve model and in the model. We've got, you know, limit switch open on close, limit switch open on open. We've got the torque. We've got the amps. We've got the, you know, hand auto. Well, then we take it all apart like Star Trek. We transport it up to a data lake and then we pay a consulting company to put it all back together again. Well, Amazon were one of the first companies that realized this, and they created a service here about two years ago called SiteWise. And SiteWise, guess what? You get to build a model in the cloud first. You instantiate the model to create an asset. So if I I build a model of of a motor, operated valve, and now I can have 100 motor operated valves. They're all derived from the same model. And then the measurements are inside of that. And that goes into the time series database. So what we did was we worked with, uh, you've had Benson with Opto 22. So we worked with Opto 22 to get ignition on an Epic. We got some uh, Rios that could read the KYZ meters of the service meter of my electricity coming into my factory. So now I know my, my starting point, this is all the, the energy coming into the factory. And then I have some three, three phase motor uh, CT clamps to put on some of the big equipment in the factory and then have a protocol like Modbus, maybe just to get the state of the machine, build a model and start publishing that to AWS SiteWise. So with zero coding, just an MQTT connection from the factory to an MQTT broker, which is AWS IoT Core, is setting there as a perfectly good service, then we could publish a model from the factory 
that shows up in Amazon site wise as a model. And now we can start pushing that data into unsupervised AI. And I think if we look at, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is where's the future going is we, we can talk about, you know, all these data scientists and, and writing data models and, and having all that. But, if we look at the millions and the millions of machines we've got out there, the only way we're going to get to that goal ultimately is perfecting unsupervised AI because we could do a model on a, a valve in a particular application. Now, that isn't going to work if I move that valve from a, a, a factory using it for vegetable oil, if I move that valve to an oil field for crude oil, right? Those are going to be different models that we're going to apply to this equipment. So even a vendor is going to have a very hard time in applying that in a process and saying, oh, well, I, I just saw this anomaly and this isn't good. So, well, and no, I, I know that's a long ways out there, but at least this is where we've taken IIoT technology, mm -hmm. taken, you know, MQTT spark plug, taken cloud computing, taking sensors in the factory and put together something that it doesn't take us 18 man months to get up and running. The goal here is to be able to go into uh, these small to medium manufacturers in Indiana and in less than a day, have some rudimentary energy insights flowing up into the cloud. Okay. That's very interesting. I would have to read up on these AWS services that you've mentioned, IoT uh, SiteWise and uh, IoT Core, because it seems like it would simplify a lot of the integrations. Go ahead. Oh, then. absolutely. Yeah, you got to. Uh, and Azure is coming out with their Azure Digital Twin. So, what we want to get to is the fact that I want to be able to build a model as far to the edge as I can mm -hmm. and with no programming have that model show up in the cloud. Now, it, it is gonna show up in my, my SCADA system and my control system. And you know, I'm going back to the, the thing that I said before is that this is OT, this isn't IT down to OT, it's OT up to IT. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the things I always say, because I was a SCADA engineer, if we can't show our operational managers, our SCADA supervisors, our plant manager, if we can't show them this new technology is better, faster, more secure, more available as an OT system, we're never going to get to IIoT. Mm -hmm. They're never going to put it in, right? They're going to say, well, Vlad, if you can't show me that, I'm going to pull mods. Yep. Interesting. Inter and then... Have you guys, uh, is, is this project you're talking about, Arlen, far enough along that there have been successes and, uh, and these, <clears throat> excuse me, this is actually been, being implemented with some of the Indiana small and medium-sized manufacturing companies? Uh, that, that will be, uh, watch this space. Uh, we're literally having a, um, a kind of a discovery day of mm -hmm. the first 10, the first 10 early adopter customers. Yep. And then we'll, after the next quarter, we'll have another meeting with that. And definitely if you go and, and Google the state of Indiana energy insights, it's capital I N sites, um, <laughs> you'll see the customers that are participating and hopefully we'll be able to publish those outcomes here very, very shortly. No, I, I love that. Uh, I love that, and I love uh, the 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 like the theoretical ability that you don't have to be a SCADA engineer, and that most people should reasonably be able to take this and get a facility, even if it's just kind of like a first test case up and running. Uh, to, to your point, Island, I have always found that if you can show people, being able to show people how something works is so much easier, and if we can leverage someone on the IT side, or if you can ever, or if it could be like an intern project or something along those, those lines, and it doesn't take some of the most critical resources that you have as an organization, you can show that there are good opportunities there, find wins. And then once you can find the wins and show the organization, then you're almost certainly going to find much further adoption. Well, and, and, and the, I, the thing to me is that I always say, I want a mere human being to understand this, yes. right? I, we can go into all these verticals, but I'll, I'll give you an example of a flow computer. 
and a flow computer is like a PLC and you get all these process variables and 90% of it's enumerated. And mm -hmm. Vlad, you know what that, so behind you, you could say, well, that PLC is going to, if it has this, it's going to be a zero, one, two, or a three. And yeah. so, so Dave's up there and he gets the two. Well, what's that? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the beauty of spark plug is you can start taking these nebulous enumerated things that we keep throwing at IT and go, come on, IT, why can't you guys figure this out? You know, and give it context so that when it comes up, you go, oh, wait a minute. You know, this is this this is this machine and it's telling me that I've got a problem. I've got a you know clutch stuck. I've, I'm in fault mode or whatever. And I don't have to you know call 14 different people and, and have to remember that and then have a human type that. And then you go, well, I just did that model. And they go, oh no, this, this PLC does it completely different. And this PLC does it different again. Mm -hmm. So get, getting that contextual model to say, I don't care what you got out in the field, but at some point, as far out into that tribal knowledge stream as we can, let's get that thing contextualized so that now everything upstream can understand that. And, and I, I would, I really like the example, Arlen, of uh, getting up and running really quick, right? So with some of the cloud services that you've mentioned, again, you don't need a server that's going to be on-prem. You're cutting out so to speak, like the middleman, and it's becoming a lot easier to kind of get these proof of concept projects up and running. And as we've talked about a little bit earlier, I'd really hope some of the vendors would finish adopting MQTT. That way you would need even less <laughs> hardware right, or like edge <laughs> processors to convert that's the nice. protocols. But that's that, that's a that's a completely separate discussion. But no, I, I really think that making it simpler for engineers in the field to kind of at least show that there's progress being made on some of these projects and initiatives to then be able to, again, take it from a small proof of concept and scale. Uh, I think it's critical for adoption in IOT in many use cases. Well, uh, what's exciting to me, Vlad, is you could take any of those PLCs or that Opto 22 setting behind you. Once you had a UDT built, literally, you could take that model and have it in sitewise in three seconds. And to your point, to your point, now you can call IT and say, okay, that that device that's in the plant, now it's up there, it's in your cloud, it's 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 going into your time series database. You can take it into unsupervised AI, you can take it into anything you want to, but there you go, there's your data. I'll need to do a bit more reading. Uh, you know, we had used an EC2 instance that ran a broker and then had an instance of ignition and uh, timescale DB. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I would have to do a bit more research on these services to uh, see what they have to offer. That, uh, that's an interesting value proposition. appreciate that. Yep. I, I agree. So I want to I wanna touch on that context uh, a little bit more, but first we've got some people to thank. So Vlad's going to play a, a sound and he's going to pick up a, uh, he's going to pick up a PLC and we'll talk about it a little bit. Awesome. So we want to thank uh, Phoenix Contact again for sponsoring the IIoT theme. And we're talking about the PLC Next, uh, which Vlad is current. Well, Vlad was supposed to be holding up, but apparently on the fourth time we do this, he has missed his cue. Uh, <laughs> and we want to talk specifically about the Edge Gateway as a state of the art IIoT and edge computing solution. So it's designed for data collection in the most demanding environments, whether you have a small machine or an entire manufacturing floor. The PLC Next Edge Gateway leverages its advanced industrial design and programming openness to collect data from any device or sensor and send it directly to the cloud service of your choice, any data, any cloud. Uh, I will make the point that we do know uh, Vlad has actually done and used MQTT uh, with one of those devices um, in the past. And at some point, you guys should absolutely keep poking Vlad. Solus PLC will have the second longer version of the PLC Next course uh, that, that they have coming out. Uh, and I just, I feel compelled to just throw that in and, and poke them a little bit every time, Arlen. But no, we want to thank, uh, we want to thank uh, Phoenix Contact uh, for sponsoring this theme. You guys can absolutely go ahead and check them out in all of the links and descriptions below. And if you have any questions, you of course can feel free to reach out to Vlad, myself, or any of the, I don't know, probably four or five or six P, uh, Phoenix Contact folks we've had on the show or the 10,000 that, uh, that you can find floating around LinkedIn. Um, but with that, I want to talk a little bit more about context, Arlen. I, I think you brought up a good point. You know, 
you've been talking about kind of bridging that that IT OT right, and that you want to allow an IT person to kind of look at any of the pieces of information and not need to be a product specialist or a process specialist to understand uh, what that is. I, I think that we have had a kind of a similar conversation nearly with, with every group that we've talked about. And you also said that you kind of started trying to sell IT to OT and now, now kind of vice versa. And you, you're, you've kind of over the last 20 or so years found this happy medium. I guess that's the long way around asking, are you seeing that we are doing a better job sending context with data um, from the plant floor through IIoT or other solutions so that anyone can read it? Or is that still a gap that we have that we as an industry need to get better? I think we're starting to see it, but it's a gap that we as an industry start needing to get better. Uh, again, um, I, I love what you can do with cloud. I love all the tooling and all that. But again, let's go back. If we've got to hire consultants to write lambdas and Python code and go into data lakes and out of data lakes, it, it's never going to happen. We've got to get to the point where we can take the, our operational data and immediately get that into models that we can start using. So we, we have a lot of pieces and I'll, I'll just say this if you look at what and i think the especially uh, amazon and microsoft they they got out there and they did a thing they they may regret they they put a secure container out in the field yeah. as your uh, yeah as your edge or aws greengrass yeah. but what they did was that opened it up for people to just start writing programs and so by the time you come into a failed product project and you see what was happening, somebody wrote a really bad SCADA system in Python in little chunks, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to resist the urge to follow it out there and write code. I mean, we, we all, you know, I'm a good, I can write anything in, in, in C and, you know, we'll talk about books, but that's my favorite book is, you know, Kernigan and Ritchie, and I can do anything, but that's not helping industry, right? Yep. We've got to have tools on platforms, not coding on operating systems. Okay. I, I love that. And, and I know Vlad has a thousand questions on that, but we actually have a question that uh, in the chat that I think goes really well. So Hugo is asking, well, he's saying that he's a hundred percent with, with what you're saying, uh, but he has a question on the adoption of technology, right? So um, big brands, I mean, I, I think big brands kind of either OEMs or end users are very slow in adopting new technologies for a variety of reasons. Do you think they're slow because they're just large organizations? Do you think it's because they made a huge investment of time and money in the previous decades and they don't want to move forward? Do you think that, that, that they're slow for some other reason? I think it's a question of adoption. Like, do you see that we are going to start adopting MQTT and other technologies quicker from some of the larger organizations? Uh, the, the, the demand that I'm seeing, um, again, I'll say this, SiriusLink did not mean for SparkPlug to take off. I mean, we did it, and all of a sudden, we had, like Chevron, they're going, okay, uh, Arlen, who owns this? And we go, well, we put it in our public GitHub site. Well, no, no, really. Who owns so we, we took all of the IP, and we mm -hmm. gave it to the Eclipse Software Foundation. Mm -hmm. So it lives, they own it, it lives over in a standards body, it lives over in a company that does software, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the demand that we saw was coming from the customers to the vendors. They're saying, hey, you, if you don't put MQTD spark plug on that device, you won't be getting an RFP from us. Mm -hmm. And that's driven a lot of the demand that I've seen on MQTT and Sparkplug because they say, hey, we want that on there. And, and you're right, if an entrenched player doesn't have a reason to move, they won't move. Yep. And sometimes they move quickly and sometimes they don't, they don't move as quick. And again, uh, the PLC Next is fantastic. I got to see it using, uh, doing MQTT Sparkplug at the ARC forum mm -hmm. in Orlando two weeks ago. Absolute great piece of product. Arlen, I, I really like where the conversation is going. I had a question, you know, more on the skill set side, and I think we've touched a little bit on it when, you know, we talked about data being funneled into the cloud, and then there's 
typically a, a contractor or someone trying to figure out how to use that data. But I think the question for everyone, uh, and I would say, especially for those who are maybe earlier in their career, is to try and figure out where does the opportunity lie. And it could also be, I guess, taken from a, an OEM standpoint, right? So imagine that I'm currently a plant manager. I'm trying to see in five years what kind of skills do we need in our facility. And I'm trying to map out maybe what kind of, I would say, like engineers or, or, or techs to hire. And I'm wondering, like, what are your thoughts on, you know, people who are more heavily focused on the control side, people who are focused on networks, people who are focused on software, people who are focused on data analytics, like cloud infrastructure? Like, do you see like major opportunities of growth and uh, what, uh, again, it could be more like career decisions for some of us. It could be opportunities for, for plant managers who may be, I would say like, I guess maybe the word is sometimes like don't under, like underestimate the complexity, right, of getting this data into the cloud and then being able to process and give out like tangible, actionable, I would say information, right? There, there's a lot of knowledge that goes into that. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on who would be the best positioned in, let's say, five to 10 year time frame. Well, you know, I think it's it. From what I'm seeing out there right now, it, it is a a mix of you know the, the perfect combination is people that are mechanically oriented. They're going to be tending more towards PLCs. They're going to say, "Hey, you know, I want to write ladder logic. I want to see this motor operate. I want to see this uh, stack light come on and off." That, that's what really drives me. Well, that's mm -hmm. great. We need those skill sets. But then, once you're interested in that, maybe go back a little bit and say, "Okay." Well, I've got the mechanical part down. Maybe I need to learn a little bit about networking. Maybe I need to learn a little bit about, you know, uh, how I put together, just deploy cloud infrastructure. And I think all of those skill sets are going to be required going forward. Um, you know, from my background, having that electrical engineering and a computer science a bit, but that doesn't teach you anything about what's going to happen in the real world. So, you know, Education is great. We, we got to have that. But it's also getting your hands dirty like you, like me, is having equipment. We yeah, people laugh at, you know, all this stuff that we've got behind us. But it is the Internet of Things. I keep telling people it's the inter things. Right. It's not you, you got to get the screwdriver out. You've got to get this stuff working. And I think that's where we're going to get the skill sets going forward. It's getting young engineers interested. It's the, the Raspberry Pi syndrome, right? I think the Raspberry Pi probably did the, one of the greatest favors to us as an industry in that, well, in the old days before COVID, you could get a Raspberry Pi for 45 bucks. Uh, you could get it up and running. You could download the Paho client from Eclipse. You could get MQTT running. You could get a relay hat for it. And all of a sudden you're sending NQTT commands and you're turning light bulbs on and off. And I think the, all of the skill sets involved in that are leading to where our future engineers are going to be. And I could already, you know, Arlen, on that last example, anticipate some comments of people commenting and saying that <laughs> it's not an industrial solution. I think, again, it's important to take a step back. And again, we've talked about this a few minutes ago, but realize that the proof of concept and being able to like switch on that light on and off, or even again, you can model a few analog tags on your Raspberry Pi, or even you know funnel that into an AWS service as and so use it as an edge device is the initial step. And once you have that proof of concept, you can scale to better, more industrialized uh, hardware and software. But ultimately, I think it's important to have these low cost solutions that can be leveraged to kind of establish a baseline, right? Well, when I go to colleges and, and talk, I mean, you go, you, you get in front of uh, electrical engineering class today and you say, how many of you have a Raspberry Pi in your dorm room? Every hand goes up. Every hand, right? They're doing something with them. And that, to me, is getting them excited. It, you know, I'm fortunate in my career is that after doing this for 44 years, I'm still excited to get up and learn, you know, what I can do today. And I think we've got to get these college students and these future engineers that are going to manufacturing, into oil and gas, into solar, into water, wastewater, into smart city, smart industrial, 
is get them the skill sets that they need. It doesn't matter what sector they go into. You, you and I both know that SCADA is SCADA is SCADA, right? You could go to a manufacturing plant or you can go to a remote site with an oil well. And the technologies to make those things happen are the same. Are the, same. the vernacular may change, the network medium may change, but the, the mechanics are the same across the board. And I think, Arlen, to your point, it's it's great to see OEMs realize that opportunity as well. And I think, you know, inductive automation has done an excellent job at making their platform so open that you can pick up a Raspberry Pi and send tags, you know, to a test mm-hmm. instance of uh, ignition and be able to see that data, right? You have to reset it. There's some little caveats, but ultimately you're able to plug and play the solution and be able to monitor a lot of different data coming in. So you don't need to spend it. Again, I'm sure you could ask the question of how many of the students have a $5,000 PLC in their in their dorm room. And that's going to be <laughs> exactly. So I hope, you know, from my standpoint, that manufacturers of these devices recognize this opportunity and make it a little bit uh, more open, just like, as I've mentioned, inductive automation has done. Yeah, and they've done, and they they do have the maker edition, so yep. you don't have to go there and reset the trial for for mm-hmm. students and for uh, home enthusiasts. They've got the maker edition, which right. get get you up the curve and let you kind of see the art of the possible without spending tons and tons of money to do that. What was the restriction on that? I remember hearing about it when it came out, which probably isn't like a few years now, but do you know if it's uh, it's, it's just been out it's a, a different license, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's called the Maker's Edition. So you download Ignition from their website and you install it. And one of the install options is the Maker Edition. And the licensing is you go in there and it, it goes to a licensing server. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're using it for a, a home or for school or whatever, it's a free, never expiring version of Ignition. It's it's certainly non-commercial, right? So the, the right. goal is to allow students and home enthusiasts, as many of the, as many of the inductive automation folks are, they've built some of the craziest home automation systems <laughs> you'll ever see. Um, but I think the goal is to allow people to do it without fifty thousand dollars of licensing, as long as you're not using it to uh, to go ahead and run your facility. Is is how I generally understand. Uh, the That's correct. Edition. So, for, yep. I mean, Vlad, you probably have too many PL. You probably have so many PLCs on the wall behind you that you're absolutely going to get red flag. They're going to look at it and they're like, "This guy is running 52 PLCs and five Raspberry Pis." I'm not sure. It's uh, you'd probably have to send them some videos of uh, what the backdrop <laughs> looks like, uh, so so that they can give you the yes. We mostly believe he's not running uh, <clears throat> anything major uh, because he just has a thousand PLCs on his wall. But, uh, but no, so I think all of those are good points, Arlen, and we do want to be respectful of your time. So I, w- I want to ask you kind of the wrap-up questions that always drive into some, uh, some uh, additional good topics of conversation. So th- the first one I always ask everyone is, you know, what do you think the future holds? And I, I think it's especially interesting from someone like you because you've helped literally shape the, the current uh, phase of, of where we are, both on the industrial and on the non-industrial sector. So w- what do you think the future of, automation of IIoT looks like? You, I will take this note. It, it is this Raspberry Pi mentality. Mm-hmm. I think more and more what I'm seeing is that um, OEMs are doing just like inductive automation. They're making their, their hardware platforms more open, yep. easier to use, more available. Um, um, I, I think the days of, you know, restrictive licensing and, and proprietary, especially anything proprietary. I mean, I, I think with open process automation, with uh, we even with OPCUA, with the Spark Plug B Working Group and MQTT, we're all seeing that if you don't have an open standard mm-hmm. going forward in the future, you're probably not going to survive much longer if you're proprietary. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing is that this notion, again, um, and I've, I've had many, many, many customers, Arlen, you know, I want to be able to walk into a plant with proper permission, plug my laptop in, and I want to learn about the plant in 10 seconds. Okay, we can do that. That, that is a doable thing today. But we've got to get to the point where our mentality is connecting devices to infrastructure and not to applications. Okay. We still have a 10. There's still that knee jerk reaction. Uh, oh, I got my new PLC. It's got a protocol. Therefore, I must connect it to a polling engine. And 
even though you, we can say, oh, I can change the poll table anytime, then that'll never happen because then operations will go, oh, no, no, we like it the way it was before, right? Mm -hmm. So having that, it's, it's the serendipitous nature of data. I want somebody to come up with an idea, be able to subscribe to some information and say, oh, that didn't work, unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. But the, the way that our mentality is in the industrial sector is, oh, well, we have to do this and we, this is going to be tied to this and we're going to have the Purdue model and innovation will be very slow, not for any technical reason, but because we've got all of this hard-coded machine talking to application, talking to machine, talking to application. And I can't tell you the number of times that we, and you guys know we used to do this. We had specs like this, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, okay, this Modbus register will go to here and we're going to do this and this one's going to go to here. And so you do it and then operations would go, oh, well, if you can do that, can you do, oh, well, that wasn't in the spec. I'm sorry. And that, that's my point is that to innovate, we, we need to be able to innovate without permission. And that's where we're, we're going, I think, in the future. Okay. And then I guess the follow up is I'm going to make you guess, you know, is that going to be in 10 years? Are we going to see that in the next 30 years? Is that a 21, 22 thing? Like, wh when do we think that we can reasonably get some percentage <clears throat> of end user, end user companies to not just agree to the vision, but actually be able to go? And, and be able to walk into a facility like that? I would have said it would be, if I look, if I look now, uh, yeah. we just, we did spark plug about four, probably not even four years ago mm -hmm. to where we are today. And as quickly as that has taken off, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, got, gone, you know, uh, exponential. Yep. I think that's going to happen faster than even I thought it was, truly. So I think in five years, you're going to get to the point where you're going to be able to learn your plant. You're not going to, you're not going to program your plant. You're going to learn your plant. Interesting. I, I am as, as hopeful for that as I was the first time you demoed um as the the first time you demoed mqtt where you pulled like sixty thousand ignition tags halfway across the world in like three quarters of a second and i and 10 other people in the room were absolutely speechless like how did this happen i i, I hope that we are reasonably to that speed of uh of that because that that would be an amazing future for all of us right and, and that's uh, where we, i i think for us to be competitive mm -hmm. and for us to innovate at the rate that we need to going mm -hmm. forward we're going to have to be able to do that. Yep. I, I, I agree. I think that that I, I am not quite as bullish on the time frame, but I, I agree that that is the direction in which, uh, in which we need to get to. Uh, so next question for you, Arlen is, is some career advice. Uh, if someone is early to mid career is generally what I ask uh, in manufacturing and automation, you know, what, what are your suggestions or do's or don'ts? Should, should they follow your career path or should they do something uh, a little bit different? You know, uh, when I look at, I was always mechanically oriented. I love taking things apart, not necessarily putting them back together again, but I love taking <laughs> them apart. Um, I would say that the first thing, do what you enjoy. I mean, I am so blessed in the fact that I absolutely enjoy what I do and I've enjoyed it every day. And, you know, I told my wife someday I'm going to write a book explaining what I do so she can read the book. So that when we go to a party, she doesn't just go, oh, well, he plays with computers. <laughs> but, um, you know, find that passion point and then be able to expand around it. But uh, I would say every customer, every plant that I go to, every OEM that we're talking to are in dire need of engineers that want to get out there and learn something. And mm -hmm. to me, you don't have to have a PhD. You've got to have a personality and a willingness to learn. In fact, uh, at, at when I was CTO for our comp control system, I was CTO for Eurotech. And it got to the point where I didn't look at what college they went to. I didn't look at what degrees they had. I didn't look. I said, are you personable and do you want to learn? Yep. And if you have those qualities, everything else will come. I... 
I think that that is exceptionally good advice. I think that those are the intangible skills, if you will, the soft skills, as we have called them before. Mm -hmm. Those are much more important. Everything else is learnable. Everything else is absolutely teachable. Uh, When we talk about that, those are also some of the most difficult things for people to figure out how to do um, or or how to do well, how to be personable and how to have an open enough mind uh, to be able to learn. Uh, well, for, first of all, if you can't communicate, you can have the best ideas in the world and nobody's going to listen to you anyway. Number one. Yes. Number two is that if you if you can't solve and you can go, you can be the best computer. You can have straight A's in computer science. Right. Mm-hmm. But given the problem of how do I get my PID to loop on an on a control valve, you don't have a clue how to get started on that. And so yep. you've got to take, you know, your education is important, but then apply that into something that you enjoy. I love that. I think that that is fantastic advice. May all of us at some point be able to take what we are passionate about and turn it into something that pays the bills. If you you (laughs) can do that, you are an absolutely uh, lucky human being. Uh, So so the next question for you, you teed us a little bit as to uh, a book recommendation. So, so, so go give us the, uh, go give us the, the C programming language book recommendation, please. Well, that, that, yeah, Kernigan and Ritchie, it was written in 1978. And I swear, this is the only programming book I've ever had. I can do Python, I can do JavaScript. And so if you talk to my VP of engineering, Wes Johnson, Mm -hmm. Wes, I hired him out of college and it was funny. Um, he, he knew object oriented programming and all that. And so he got to know me after about six months or so. And, you know, we're having a beer or whatever. And he said, Arlen, because he's looking at all this Java code that I wrote before we hired him. He goes, you know what? You write really good C code in Java. (laughs) And so, (laughs) so anyway, and, and if you know that you get the inside joke, but, um, it was funny. You guys asked me about books and stuff like that. You know, I, I, I have no recommendation on business books because I've never read one. Um, but I will say that I was just thinking, my mom was a teacher and, and I'd spent a lot of time in the library and I got to start, I think it was in fourth grade. I didn't realize that the Wizard of Oz, there's actually 14, Frank L. Baum wrote 14 Wizard of Oz books, like a series. So in one summer, I read them all, which then that led to, um J.R. Tolkien so I read all the Lord of the Rings well that read led to Dune so I read all the Dune books um I that those are all the books I like but as far as business books none but I will tell you one real quick so I'm I'm flying from England back mm-hmm. and, you know and the in Gatwick airport they had the the bargain book table and so I bought this book and I'm getting on the flight And I I read the whole book in the flight on the way back. And I'm going, wow, that was awesome. Well, it was the first edition Harry Potter. I had no idea. I'd never heard of R.K. Rowling. Nobody had heard of her. But uh, again, very interesting from that standpoint. But anyway. Read the rest of them or just the first one? Oh, I read them all. But (laughs) but I've got that first edition. But and it's it's actually in British English, right? So uh, they had a the boot instead of the trunk, and they had a yep. torch instead of the flashlight, and so on and so forth. <laughs> interesting. I uh, I at some point, Arlen, we will have to uh, to go back and look at the book recommendations. I would imagine uh, nearly half of the people who come on this show have some sort of sci-fi or sci-fi esque. Uh, or fantasy style of uh, book recommendations as a, as a non-business uh, book. Yep. And, and as yep. we told you, our, our suggestions, are, our book recommendations are always, what do you like as opposed to some sort of business book? Uh, I'm, right. I'm not sure there are very many people that read business books that, that like them. And as I, have found, <laughs> I have found most of them are very repetitive, right? You read five or six and you've basically consumed every business theory uh, you basically consumed every business theory, and beyond that, we just kind of start uh, eating each other. Um, right. Well, and yeah. and you can imagine when Chris and I started Seriously, uh, we go to the venture capitalist and we go, "Oh, we got this really cool idea. It's called MQTT, and it's the Internet of Things." And there was there is no business book on the planet that would explain how we could have got that started, except to bootstrap it ourselves. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. I, I find many very technical business ventures like that. 
unless you know a group who just who knows you and is willing to invest in you and whatever it is that you want to do, you, you're probably bootstrapping it yourself. And if you can bootstrap it yourself, you're certainly going to be much more successful than, yep. uh, than trying to grab a lot of money and suddenly figure out how to try to use a lot of money to uh, <laughs> to build the product that you can't build yourself. And uh, I think that, uh, that that is both a great book and and a great uh, recommendation. The last question we have for you, Arlen, is is who should reach out to you? Know, who do you want to do work with? Who do you want to connect? and talk with are you guys hiring this is kind of the open floor for uh for you well yes we we are hiring we're looking for developers that would be interested again we're not a huge company Mm -hmm. um our developers uh are in vancouver washington so uh, i'm in stillwater oklahoma but our uh wes and the entire development team are in vancouver so if anybody's in the vancouver area but as far as you know me you, you can tell um, anybody that wants to learn more about MQTT, more about Sparkplug, more about how we are applying that, hey, reach out to me. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, my email address is, is arlen.nipper at cirrus-link.com. And I look forward to hearing, you know, anybody. And then, you know, if you got ideas or, hey, Arlen, how do I get started in the Sparkplug working group? Uh, you can definitely Google that, go out there, get, get on the Slack channel. I mean, you don't have to be a member of Eclipse to be on the Slack channel and just watch what's going on in the development of the Sparkplug specification. Um, you know, anything from that standpoint, and even ideas on what we can do next, you know, there is going to be, the reason there's a Sparkplug B is there will be a Sparkplug C and so on and so forth. So, you know, industries that are outside of, you know, mission critical, uh, that might be able to leverage some of the notions of what we're doing with Sparkplug. Um, I'm very interested to hear that. No, I, I think that's amazing. Uh, so we, so everyone who is watching this live should have Arlen's information um, on the live shows. If you guys are listening to this on podcast form, we will make sure to put uh, Arlen in the series <coughs> link information from there, I, I will give a I will give a shout out to kind of all the serious link content. Nearly any time I have got a question about MQTT or Sparkplug B or a lot of time, how do I push up or pull down very easily information uh, from control systems to uh, to almost any sort of cloud hosting uh, specification? There is a serious link link. Uh, at, the, at the very close to the top of uh, of my Google, and there is always some very great information uh, there. But no, Arlen, we want to thank you uh, for joining us. This has been amazing. Um, again, I will make the comment. If you guys have not followed Arlen and Sirius Link, uh, please go ahead and, and do that. Follow Vlad and myself. Uh, go ahead and uh, and like uh, the show that you're listening to. If you're listening to the podcast, please give us a, a like and a thumbs up and a five star rating wherever you can. It helps. Arlen, I like to joke that we could tell them why it helps on the algorithm, but that is not this show. Um, <laughs> but but no, everyone, this has been amazing. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you to Phoenix Contact for sponsoring the IIoT theme. If you guys have thoughts or feedback, again, we always welcome that. Please feel free to reach out next month in July. We're going to talk about what a modern enterprise architecture should look like. So stay tuned for us Wednesday at normal times uh, in the afternoon. Until next time, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you, Arlen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks.